Welcome to Blog Her 17. I hope you're having a great evening and not humid at all, Orlando. Um, I'm Reshma Gopaldas, and I'm the head of video for Chino's. Before I worked at Chino's, I worked for a little known company called Planned Parenthood, <laughs> where I met Cecile Richards. Now, you've seen Cecile on the news, so I'm going to tell you about the Cecile that I know, the one that the media doesn't show. The Cecile that danced the electric slide with our entire staff for Pride Week and let me film it. In fact, she let me, she danced over 10 times with our staff. The only stipulation was that it could never, ever go on social. I'm hoping there's a statute of limitations on that because I'm telling you, Cecile Richards, the dance years would crush. Um, she also came to every single one of our company softball games and smiled through them, even when we lost 42 to 7. I know that sounds like a football score. It was a devastating loss. Um, the best way to describe Cecile, though, is our Thanksgiving bake-off. Now, Cecile really likes to make pies, and she makes good pies. The thing she loves more than making pies is winning pie contests. So she walks in one year with what I believe was a rhubarb pie. And she could smell the wind in the air. She looked at all the other subpar pies and she knew she had this. Until one of our colleagues walked in with a 50 layer crepe cake. Cecile looked at that cake like it was a piece of crepe. Let's just say the rhubarb pie came in third place. But the, real, the best thing about Cecile, which is why we're here today, is that she stands up for women no matter what. She is advocating for the next generation and she will stand up for you unless you make a better pie than her. <laughs> the other person who's joining us on stage tonight is just as amazing. Now you may know her as the biological product of two politicians. <laughs> One politician who won the electoral vote and one who won the popular vote. Chelsea Clinton is the vice chair of the Clinton Foundation. She focuses her programs on addressing important health issues. She is a mother. She is also an author of books for young readers that addresses, addresses female empowerment and telling kids that they can make a difference. But like Cecile, she advocates for women and young girls. And she is continuing her family's legacy of public service. Please join me in welcoming my good friend Cecile Richards and the wonderful Chelsea Clinton. Hi. Thank you, Reshma, for that introduction. Thank you to Blog Her um, and She Knows Media for inviting Cecile and me here today. Thank you for that warm uh, welcome. It's great to be here in Orlando um, with all of you. Um, Cecile and I are uh, going to have a conversation about uh, health, health equity, access to health, uh, women's rights, and kind of anything else that may emerge along the way. Um, and I want to give Cecile a chance to start our conversation this afternoon uh, talking about what Planned Parenthood actually does, because I think there uh, is a big misconception about what Planned Parenthood does and what Planned Parenthood is to millions of women and families across our country and why it is such an essential part of our uh, healthcare ecosystem and why it is at the center of not only um, standing up for, for women, but also families, standing up for our reproductive uh, rights and, and economic justice. So I just am so thrilled to be here with one of my great uh, heroes, Cecile Richards, and uh, listen to her uh, share with us a little bit about kind of what Planned Parenthood is and why it is uh, so deserving of our support, particularly at this moment in time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, and it's great to be here. Great to be your blogger. And uh, yay for... I mean, as I say to Chelsea, women are leading the resistance in this country, so it's so great to be here with all of you. 
um, really exciting. And I want to make sure that um, I will tell you a tiny bit about Planned Parenthood, but my friends from Southwest and Central Florida Planned Parenthood are here with Barbara Dravecki, their great leader. So thank you. Thanks for what you do for women and men and young people in Florida every day. Um, and it's actually, of course, an important day because the Senate bill just came out today. And for those of you who have been in a news-free zone, uh, I'll tell you that this, this incredibly important piece of legislation that was meticulously crafted by 13 white men. Um, in secret. In secret. And uh, sort of shockingly doesn't, doesn't do well by women. And one of the most important things, of course, is that it ends access to Planned Parenthood for millions of folks in this country. And so, but we can do something about that. and We can fight this and we can beat it. So, uh, and I'll tell you why I think it's important. Yeah, let's hear it for that. I think that's important. Um, so, but just like that, you know, sort of the one-on-one -on -one of Planned Parenthood, uh, it's my real honor to work for an organization that serves millions of folks every year with healthcare. We just celebrated our 100th anniversary, which is kind of amazing. Happy anniversary. Uh, and, I was actually talking to a few folks um, earlier, and folks raised their hand if they had ever been to Planned Parenthood, but one in five women in this country have been to Planned Parenthood as a healthcare patient, including myself and probably many of you. Uh, we, we serve um, folks with a whole array of healthcare services, including birth control. Uh, we are really the experts in birth control, and we're really proud of the fact we're now at a historic all-time low for teenage pregnancy in the United States of America. Um, we, uh, we provide all kinds of cancer screenings for many women. We, d we do their well woman visit. For a lot of our patients, we're their only healthcare provider. And half of our health centers are located in medically underserved communities. Unfortunately, those are the very same communities that are going to be devastated if this health care bill becomes law. Uh, we provide um, male services. In fact, I was in the San Diego clinic the other day, and the waiting room was full of men. And Usually the, usually the television in the waiting room is on a soap opera, but today it was ESPN. So I said, hey, what's going on? They said, well, it's vasectomy day at Planned Parenthood. So um, it gets a bigger laugh from men, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but we also, uh, uh, we provide safe and legal abortion, and that's very important to us, and I just want to say that we always will, and we'll never, never back away from women's rights to, to that service. So, so that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing at Planned Parenthood. Well, thank you, Cecile, um, and I agree. The last point is important. The other parts of your work are also really vitally important. Yep. And I think too often um, kind of underappreciated. And so I, I hope if kind of all of you leave here kind of with only one kind of takeaway, um, well, it's one, what we can do to defeat the bill in the Senate, um, but second, really, kind of what, what Planned Parenthood does and, and why it means so much um, to millions of American women and families um, and why it has been so important kind of over its century of, of life. Um, and so Cecile, let's, let's talk about the news today yep. um, and, and why uh, we think this is um, such a real threat to, um, to healthcare equity and access and, and quality and ultimately health in our country and uh, disproportionately a threat uh, to women and, and families. Um, sure. And so I'll, I'll go first and offer one thought. I mean, one of the things that I find so disturbing in the proposed legislation is that um, it, it does away with essential health benefits, uh, which mean that insurers uh, will uh, once again be able to offer plans that don't include um, contraceptive care, mm -hmm. that don't include maternity care, um, that don't include kind of the benefits that have leveled up kind of what it means to have insurance. In, in our country. Um, and yet I know that's one of only kind of many challenges mm -hmm. you know, with the legislation. Yeah, but I mean, you kind of hit, hit the nail on the head. That's one of the problems when you have a bunch of people negotiating away benefits that they don't actually need. And that's kind of what's happened. And so I look at this as a, as a bill that, yes, and I, yay, babies. I hear Yeah, no, please, don't audience. feel like you have to take out so awesome. children um, at all. I think that, I mean, this is a bill that it ends, um, and we'll get, the, we'll get the final score, I think, on Monday now, they're saying, but certainly the House bill, which is, which is very similar, ends access to health care for millions of folks who are on Medicaid. And really, the folks that it goes after are women, children, and the elderly. And I think you can say a lot about a government and a country by how they treat those groups of people. And by any measure, this bill isn't just mean, it's actually meaner even than what was uh, passed by the House. 
Uh, there are several things that drive me crazy because we fought so hard to get healthcare equity for women over the last eight years and now to see it all uh, just thrown overboard. But one thing I just really do want to call out is maternity benefits, which is crazy. I remember when we were fighting for the um, Affordable Care Act and there was a debate in the Senate and one of the senators um, from Arizona, a male, said, well, uh, I can't believe that we're going to require maternity benefits. I would never need them. I'm not even kidding. I mean, and the wonderful yeah. thing is, and this is why we need more women in office, is that Senator Debbie Stabenow from Michigan turned right back around and said, I bet your mother needed them, you know? Uh, and um, so, exactly. <laughs> That's what I say. Like, if more, if more people in Congress could get pregnant, we would quit fighting about birth control uh, and Planned Parenthood. <laughs> but um, the extraordinary thing is, I kind of laughed about that. We told that. It's like, but we're actually back at that place. Yeah. Where, where they're going to end yeah. maternity benefits as a required benefit. The, the estimates today were that half the states will drop this coverage. And one of the things that's it's very specific, but I think this is a really important thing for women who are here to understand, one of the provisions is that women on Medicaid who are pregnant and give birth, and half the births in this country are Medicaid births, after 60 days, they have to go back to work or they risk losing their health care coverage. So can you imagine that for those of you who are moms, that after two months, the requirement would be that you'd be back in, in work, and God knows what you're going to do with your child, because there's no affordable child care uh, for most of these women. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that's in this bill. It's why it's so important that every single person here today uh, call their senator and lift up your voice, because we cannot have this kind of legislation. So I, yeah. I couldn't agree more emphatically. Um, and, uh, and the same uh, kind of anecdote that Cecile was sharing about um, kind of the negotiation of the Affordable Care Act, we saw it play out again. I mean, with numerous male members of Congress saying variations of, well, why should I have to pay for something I will never use? It's incredible. And just really, where do they think they came from? I mean, I just, I think about That's that. Right. Often. Everybody's got a mother. Everyone has a mother. That's right. Um, and if you think you don't, look at your belly button. Yeah. Because it is the one feature we all have. You laugh, but I think humor is actually pretty important these days uh, yeah. to kind of keep our sanity, but also to help um, bring uh, new audiences kind of into this conversation because yeah. um, this legislation not only has kind of dire consequences for, for women, for older Americans, for children, for Americans with disabilities, um, but also would affect people on employer insurance that's as right. well. And I, so that's I right. think that's an important um, kind of uh, contextual point to not forget. Like this will affect uh, health insurance for everyone who has insurance uh, in our country. Um, and so Cecile said to call your senators, the, um, the congressional um, kind of uh, Open line is 202-224-3121. Uh, yeah, just so, in case you need it. Just in case you needed it. We will be tweeting that um, out. <laughs> and uh, I'm really grateful to live in a state where I know um, my senators are, are fighting hard against this legislation. Um, but I imagine there are many people here, um, particularly maybe if you happen to be from Florida, for whom that may not be true. So I hope that you will um, make a call uh, later today. Can I just mention something? Please. Else? Yeah, please do. And uh, or if you're from Arizona or Nevada or Colorado or Ohio or number Maine, other states, or number Maine, of other states. Or all these. Uh, I mean, the, one of the things that has been reported um, because everything I see around the country and Planned Parenthood is in every single state. So I've I've been in every state and keep going back to them. Is that whether it's town hall meetings um, or folks who are uh, expressing their concern or writing their stories, it's women primarily. And in fact, we, um, one of the reports is that, uh, that they, they estimate that 86% of the calls coming into Congress opposing the health care legislation are coming from women. That's 86% of the folks who are calling. That is amazing. And I think it shows um, both the power of women uh, because people are paying attention. Uh, and it shows how much women are concerned about what would happen. I know what we saw at Planned Parenthood the day after the election um, that week, we had a 900% increase in folks trying to get in to get an IUD that would last at least four years. Let's put it that way. So, um, and that's incredible to me that women would now have to be, because it was women were worried about losing their health care coverage, losing their birth control coverage. 
women shouldn't be having to choose their birth no. control method based on who's in the, in the White House. So, um, absolutely not. And, and I know, you know, Cecile, um, that also uh, should be true for women around the world. That's absolutely And, right. and one of the things that has been so um, painful um, that has already happened in this administration uh, is uh, the administration's decision to um, kind of stop American support for UNFPA uh, and to apply the global gag rule to all of U.S. global health funding, right. um, which is really um, so deeply um, painful because we know that will cost women's lives around the world. Right. It's so frustrating, and I'm really glad because everything we do in this country has a ripple effect. And so, yes, the first day in office, um, the new president signed uh, the global gag rule, which for folks who don't know and haven't followed these issues, it essentially says that uh, across the world, the U.S. will no longer invest in uh, programs that um, any, any place where abortion is even discussed or uh, provided uh, for any program that does maternal or child health care, but now it's been expanded. It's so all risks healthcare. programs, right, programs that are working on HIV, on Zika infection. And it's really frustrating because we actually had made huge progress under the Obama administration in reducing maternal mortality in the, world. the world. And that is some, why wouldn't every single person in this country want to do that? And, uh, but it is these kinds of policies that are now going to reverse that trend. And, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm from the state of Texas, and I don't have any Texans here. All right, a small but mighty bunch. And um, I mean, in Texas, in the 21st century, after all the things that the state of Texas has done to reduce women's access to care, and I'm not only saying this because they're, I mean, we have global examples, we have domestic examples. The, the maternal mortality rate in the state of Texas has doubled. There is no reason for that. The only reason for that is because people have put politics ahead of women's health care and women's lives. It's just completely unacceptable. And, um, and one of the kind of important parts of this conversation, I think, is to also realize how um, decisions that um, President Trump and his administration have made that may seem unrelated to health care and, and women's health um, are often still painfully intimately connected. Um, so you mentioned Zika. Right. Um, because of uh, President Trump's blanket federal hiring freeze, we now have more than 700 open positions at the CDC, yeah. including in departments that work exactly on Zika. Right. You know, that has direct consequences for not only uh, Puerto Rico, that clearly is at the epicenter of what's happening with Zika in the United States, but also here in Florida. Right. Right. And so I just think it's so important um, to kind of think about women's health and health equity and women's rights as kind of not only kind of maternal health mm -hmm. and access to reproductive health care, but all the different ways in which um, the Trump administration is really negatively impacting um, those areas, even when it may not be apparent yep. how that's happening. Yep. Well, and one other thing, I mean, I just we can look around the globe and see examples of where women are actually beginning to get some representational equity. And of course, it was really exciting when Justin Trudeau uh, appointed half of his cabinet as women. And, uh, <laughs> and I love, and I'm sure everyone remembers his great quote when they said, well, why did you do that? And he says, because it's 2015. Um, well, it's 2017. Uh, and so, and then, of course, now looking at France and having uh, half of the cabinet in France be women uh, and look at state, uh, countries like Sweden where because women are basically half of the uh, cabinet, almost half of the parliament, there's 16 uh, months of paid family leave, okay? That's the kind of difference it makes when you have people in government who are representing everyone and every diverse group. And I do think that I mean, I know we'll talk about what people can do because I think it can be a very discouraging time for women right now. Well, for everyone, but, um, but for women in particular. And one of the things that women can do is run for office. And I'm glad your mother did, and thank you very much for um, thank you. what she did. Um, well, I, I couldn't agree more with Cecile. 
Um, but you know what? I want to say this, Chelsea, because I've been thinking about it a lot. I know we both traveled a lot for her, and she, God knows she traveled a lot. But because Secretary Clinton ran, um, the next woman will have an easier time, and she won't be the first one. And she did an enormous service for all. Oh, thank you. That. Um, but I think it's, uh, I mean, there may be someone here who wants to run for president. That would be awesome. But I'm also just seeing, it's, I know Emily's list that trains women to run for office said, Two years ago, um, after the election, they had 1,000 women that wanted to run for office. This year, just since this election, they've had 15,000, OK? I mean, it's just like, it feels like it's well, and, really taking, taking on and, steam. And Cecile, I think when you said, you know, there might be someone here who um, wants to run for president, and I have lots of thoughts, if you are so inspired. <laughs> um, but what, what um, Emily's List and Off the Sidelines and Run for Something, I mean, all these uh, organizations that are um, supporting, encouraging, kind of uh, facilitating and women engaging in politics are also saying that I find really exciting is that women are raising their hands and saying they want to run for the local school board, the city council, the district attorney, the state legislature, you know, the governorship, you know, to, to be their congressional representative or their senator. And that's hugely important because you know, who's elected at every level of government really matters. That's right. You know, That's including right. in the issues that we're talking about here today. And so I'm really excited yeah. by that, and that definitely deserves an applause. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, I'm for that. Um, uh, well, and the chances are that most of you in this room could do a better job than whoever's in office. I'm just going to say that. So, um, but uh, can I give you a good example? Like Please. A, kind of an interesting. This is how. I just feel like every woman is doing more than she ever thought she was going to need to do in her lifetime. And I was. So as, I was as we often do. Yes, exactly. He's like, oh, yeah, well, I can do that. And uh, so I was, I was back in Michigan. Um, uh, and uh, oh, yeah, get some. I'm sorry. I was back in Michigan, but this is a different story. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was in Wisconsin. OK. Um, anyway, I went to Paul Ryan's district because we have three health centers, Planned Parenthood health centers. And they are at risk of not being able to see anybody anymore because they only provide preventive services. And those are the services that it would be ended by this, by this bill. And I met with some patients there. And one was a woman named Lori Hawkins. And she said, look, I've always been a Planned Parenthood supporter. I was a patient, but I've never really you know, been um, active. But now I feel like I have to be. And then she told her story to the press where she had basically um, we had detected um, cysts, that, the ovarian cysts. She had gotten treatment. It was because of that that she was able to actually have her daughter. Her daughter's 13. She'd brought her to Washington. And so, and then also, um, they had, uh, she was from Kenosha, Wisconsin, and she and some other Planned Parenthood patients had then organized this group called Forward Kenosha, and they now had 1,300 members, okay, of women who are getting involved. And so I think that's awesome. That's great. And then I get an email about two weeks ago from an organization that trains candidates, and they said, uh, we've gotten an email from Lori Hawkins, and she's used you as a reference. She wants to run for office. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, that is what's happening now. And so here's a mom in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, who's going to run for local office. That is, what, that is what is going to change this country. Nothing is going to change because it happened in Washington, DC. It's going to change because people on the ground made it happen. And, uh, Great. Good luck to her. Yeah, good. Good luck to her. I know, um, Cecilia, we only have a few minutes left, and I know we wanted to talk about what um, we think people really can do yeah. at this moment. And certainly, uh, running for office is, is part of that. Voting in every election um, is part of that. I think that's hugely important. I, I live in uh, New York City. We have a city council elect. Oh, yeah, good. I'm glad since we now are going geographically for my fellow New Yorkers. Um, you know, we have city council elections later this year. Um, and every election really, really matters, um, whether we're focused on kind of climate change because like, recycling happens at the local level, if we're focused on criminal justice that has huge um, implications um, as to who is elected at the local, state, and federal level, as we're clearly seeing with our current attorney general. Um, and so I just think that is a hugely important part of this. It is also not the only part of this. Right. Um, and so I know, Cecilia, you wanted to share a few thoughts about kind of what um, people can do to continue to positively pressure the political process while also engaging in it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you, though, started with voting, because I do think 
we have a whole generation of folks who probably are kind of discouraged about whether voting matters, and we have to demonstrate that it does. It's the thing that makes the most difference about what kind of life you get to live as the folks in government. So as I say, you know, marching, great, and the women's marches were unbelievable. I mean, something I think none of us will ever, ever forget. Um, going to town hall meetings, great. Knitting pink, pink hats, great. Voting, uh, absolutely, essential. absolutely um, essential. And in that, I want to say um, something just because, to, just for the record, that in this last election, as discouraging as it was for, for a lot of us, I just wanna, I really want to shout out women of color because they did their part, and now it's time. Um, and they always have. And they always have. I, they always have. Um, and I will say, yeah, um, and, and, Cecile, uh, and on that, just and I'll let you have, but I just no. want to say, I mean, not only did women of color do their part, and they helped elect President Obama for two terms and did their part there, but now it's time for the rest of us to do our part as well. So it's not just an acknowledgement, it's a call to action. Um, Which is where I was going. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm always happy to be your warm-up actor, your no, follow-up no. <laughs> actor. I think we're the Anything same I wavelength. Can ever do. I think we're um, the same wavelength. Because I think um, um, I think this sense of solidarity can't be uh, overstated. Absolutely. Um, particularly at this moment in time, and and well, and also on that, yeah, I think because part of this is, and I know, I mean, your mom talked about this on the campaign, but as we know, all of these issues intersect. Okay, so, I mean, we're talking about Planned Parenthood, and yeah, let's give it up for intersectionality, because it's all, women understand that, you know? Women understand that, that our lives are so complex, and I think it's a really important, so we talk about, it's important to have Planned Parenthood access because you want to have your health care. It's important because you want to actually be able to raise your family and have a job and be part of the economy and finish school, and you can't disconnect any of this. I mean, we've been around 100 years, but we were around before birth control was legal, and back then, Women didn't finish school. Women didn't oh. actually have the opportunity and to work in the workforce. And I was actually, there's all these great figures. I mean, we're now half the workforce. We're in every, every uh, arena. I just read this fabulous statistic that the most recent NASA astronaut class for the first time, 50% women, all right? Yeah, so it all is connected. And you can't, um, you can't be healthy and you can't raise a family unless you have not only access to health care, access to a living wage, access to uh, a decent uh, public school system, access to environmental uh, equity. Everyone deserves good drinking water, whether you're in Flint, Michigan, you're in Washington, D.C., or you're in Orlando, no, Florida, it doesn't matter. All of these things come together. So anyway. I don't know. I, yeah. I totally agree. I, yeah. I was just going to say um, that I think it's also important, since we were talking about voting and yeah. Um, since you pointed out that uh, women of color showed up, as thankfully yep. kind of women of color do, and are, it's a call to action and a challenge to the rest of us, yep. is that we have to continue to talk about barriers to voting. That's right. And Absolutely. kind of the structural continued That's disenfranchisement right. exactly that exists right. in our country. Um, yep. And yep. Um, both what we need to do to continue to um, expose those mm -hmm. uh, efforts and ameliorate them, but also really get to universal enfranchisement. That's right. Um, in a meaningful sense. That's right. Um, because that's deeply connected to everything that we're um, talking about. Uh, and also something that I know, Cecile, you and I have talked about before, getting back to teaching civics in our country mm -hmm. so that people understand right. why it is important to vote at kind of the presidential level, the state level, um, and the local level. Um, yeah. But just in our, our closing seconds, I want to because Cecile said, oh, there are lots of statistics, but I think one that really matters is it's not um, an accident that women started to really enter the labor force in our country in the early 1970s. Yep. And it's not an accident that the entrance of women into the labor force in our country has added more than three and a half trillion dollars to our GDP. So kind of when people try to kind of sideline reproductive rights, as just a women's issue. No, this is an economic issue and an equity issue, but it's an American issue. And I think we have to just continue to make that case. Um, so I know we're out of time, but I want to give the last word to Cecile. Um, but before I do that, I will say something else you can do is support Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that um, if you have already, you will continue to do so. And I hope if you haven't, you will do so. And yes, of course, um, that is uh, financial support, but it's also 
finding, raise your hands, the people who are here from Planned Parenthood. Yeah. It's also Excuse finding the people who are here from Planned Parenthood and saying thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for prov uh, providing health care um, to women here in this community. Um, because I think part of what uh, is our obligation when those of us come to places that we're not from, like Orlando, is to say thank you. And part of that is saying thank you to the Walter for kind of providing us with this beautiful space to blog her and she knows media for convening all of us. But it's also thank you to the people who are working every day to ensure that the communities where we're spending time are healthy. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I will close on this because there are so many things we need to do. We need to lift up the stories of women. We need to lift up the stories of Planned Parenthood patients. If you've ever been a patient, tell your story online, put it, you know, post it. I think it's important. But we do have basically a week to try to defeat a bill that would be not only devastating for the patients of Planned Parenthood, but for women and families everywhere. So um, call your senator, call your member of Congress repeatedly, um, call them every day. And also, if you don't know what to do or what else you can do, you can text uh, DEFEND to 22422. Uh, that's DEFEND to 22422, and we'll connect you. Or um, go on to PlannedParenthood.org, and we will absolutely uh, register. You can sign up with the 10 million supporters of Planned Parenthood that are going to continue to fight till the end of our days for women's access to health care. So, uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a lot. All right. Oh, great. Yeah, oh, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.